What's going on, family? It's your brother Lawrence here with another episode of Watch God Work. In every episode, we get the distinct pleasure and honor to speak to a brother or sister that's doing exceptional work in every field of human endeavor, and they share their God story, the ways in which God has been at work in their work, and the ways in which God has been at work through their lives. And today, I am excited. We got Jersey in the building, but you know, there's some other origins, but we'll talk about that. Yeah, you know I mean, my brother, our brother, the King. My my, my 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 ace here, man. Curtis J. McDaniel. What's going on, man? What's going on, bro? Good to see you, bro. Thanks for having me today, man. Good to be seen, man. Great to see you, uh, brother, man. Like our, our pre convo was, you know, was 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 much earlier than this, man. I got an opportunity for us to just chop it up, and um, you know, one, I think I'm partial to anybody who loves uh, the Garden State Jersey's different type of energy, <laughs> you know. But but second, um. You are um, you're one of one, man. Um, I think in our conversation, beyond what I saw about your story, um, about you really laying hold of your identity and and using your journey um, in life to serve others and encourage other brothers, especially in a time where I think people visually are in this life of comparison and wondering what they have, are they right, are they acceptable? Um, reading that. And then also seeing what you've been doing just even beyond that in the local community at abroad, Essex County, because of your story. I just said, yo, <laughs> you know, beyond us finding time to work out on a Saturday morning, man, um, I was just so hum humbled and, and, and knew it was a great privilege to be able to speak with you. Um, and so I'm only giving a, a tidbit, clearly, of what you've been able to do, your heart and life for service, um, you know, not only for, you know, those who are who could relate to your story. Uh, but just er just the community in general, and so I just know that your 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 story is going to change so many lives. But with that all said, I know I've not said enough, and so I'm going to start off as you know in tradition. Who is Curtis J. McDaniel? All right, man. So thank you for that amazing introduction, bro. Mm -hmm. um, so Curtis J. McDaniel, I'm 26 years old, from New Jersey. Was born in Bristol, Pennsylvania. I currently live in Bloomfield, New Jersey, in Essex County. Um, I am uh, one of 10 children from uh, my mother and father, half black, half Puerto Rican. Uh, I like to say I got a little Native American in me too. Um, but yeah, man, pretty much I am a uh, model, a model part-time. I'm also a community activist, uh, build affordable housing for a non-profit non -profit that is uh, locally based. And um, yeah, man, uh, I've been an influencer for a while on social media, I think it's since 2015. And so uh, it's just a pleasure to be here today. And uh, God has uh, definitely done a great work in my life. That I'm able to be where I am today to be able to be a benefit to so many people, whether it be in the streets of Newark or whether it be um, on social media to even impact people overseas and in other uh, uh, states in the U.S. as well. So, yeah, that's a little bit about who I am. Mm. Your brother, man, it's uh, it's it's a little bit, but it's a lot of, of I think, and, and it's powerful, all the things that you've said and you've been able to do. And I think. You know, some people imagine, I think anyone who at least has some level of humility and, and depth would recognize that, you know, that, you know, that a book is beyond its cover. And I think when people hear model already, this is assumption like, oh, man, you know what I mean? Like he out here, <laughs> you know, uh, um, yeah. but, but I think the thing, part of the thing that blew me away is how early I think you started to really, you know, I think encounter, I think. So many challenges, I think, in life, man. And, you know, I, you know, for you, it was 11 years old, you know, from from the perspective of just you starting your journey just with vitiligo. But I think your story with God and your story just around, OK, why am I here? Life stability and all that. I think started a little bit earlier, man. And so just just take me back. Right. You know, a little bit from Bristol to kind of early day, your, your earlier days, like just what was the environment growing up? Right, you know, with the siblings, with your home, what would you just paint a picture for people listening and watching? All right, so uh, inside my household, all right, so I had ten brothers and sisters, but um, my uh, that wasn't all from the same mother and father. So I have uh, three full brothers and sisters. I mean, I consider all my brothers and my sisters to be, you know, fully related. That's my brother, that's my sister, etc. But I got three full bloods, so uh, I was born. In Bristol, Pennsylvania, with my mother and my father. Um, but unfortunately, when I was six years old, they separated. And um, I moved to New Jersey with my father. 
stuff happened and uh, we ended up moving back with my mother. And so my household, to be honest, was pretty crazy. Um, at that time, my family, we weren't like enormously involved in church. Uh, church is more like something that we just did on Easter, on Christmas. You know, you pray before you ate your, your dinner or your breakfast um, and you try to pray before you went to bed at night. Um, Jesus was a household name, but it wasn't like we were dedicating our lives to Jesus. Mm -hmm. It was kind of just like we could do whatever we wanted to do. So because of that covering, um, pretty much uh, my life, my life it, early on, it was it was rough. Like uh, being with a single mother um, and being distant from my father and not having my father in the household was very rough. My mother was single. She was on welfare, Section 8, um, you name it, any type of government assistance program that she could be on. She could. Um, so that was rough. I remember at one point in time, my mother was only making like $15,000 a year mm. and, uh, she had five children in her household. And so she had to get on government resources on section eight, um, food stamps and all that type of stuff in order to sustain, um, our type of living. Mm. So, uh, early on it was, uh, it was very, very rough. And I think that that all comes into culmination, uh, to where I am today and to just, <laughs> Make things even worse, you know, around the same time that I got diagnosed with vitiligo, um, my mother also got diagnosed with cancer. Mm -hmm. So now she's a single, and now she can't even work. You, you get what I'm saying? And no father in the house. You get what I'm saying? So I got no guidance on life. And now I have vitiligo as well. 11 years old, I'm getting vitiligo. So the story with the vitiligo was that one day, you know, I'm young. I go to the bathroom. I'm handling my business. Mm -hmm. and I look down at my wrist. And I see this, this, this like something white. So I'm like, what? what is this? So I'm thinking it must be ash or something. Like, you know, try to lick it, put lotion on it. It wasn't going away. So I'm like calling and screaming for my mother. Like, mom, mom, mom. I don't know what's wrong with my skin. I can't get rid of this white stuff on my wrist. And so what she does is she calls the dermatologist. Um, we go to a dermatologist's appointment maybe like a uh, week later. And um, they let us know that I have something called vitiligo. It's the same thing that Michael Jackson had. Me, I'm 11 years old. I think like Michael Jackson, he went from black to white. I'm like, hold up. Uh -uh, I don't want to be, mm -hmm. I'm a black boy. I don't want to be white. So that obviously hit me in a very hard way. Mm -hmm. So going to school, eventually it just spread it like that. Like it went from my wrist to, I wish I had pictures I could pull up. It went from my wrist here mm -hmm. to around my lip and to around my nose. And from there, it just spread more and more and more. Yeah. And you know, like kids, when you're old, people love to have these roasting sessions yeah. when you just get roasted. And so once the roasting sessions came in class, I'm like, oh man, I know, I know who they about to target. Yeah. So um, that was fun. I mean, it was, I wouldn't say it was fun at the same time that it was fun because I would roast back. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. I would roast back. Sometimes you hit it. People would go too far. Yeah. Sometimes I had. Let people know that I wasn't the type of person that you could just talk to about any type of way. Mm. Um, so I got up fights because of it. And I kind of walked in my early life with a chip on my shoulder mm. because I was I was poor. I had been a LIGO. On top of that, I was in special ed. All this stuff. So I was walking around angry mm. all the time. If you looked at me any type of way, I was ready to throw hands. Mm. And so yeah, like in eighth grade, I almost got expelled. A whole bunch of stuff from getting in fights. And so, uh, yeah, so early on, because of the culmination of all that type of stuff, it was it was really hard. And my mom having cancer um, and not being able to, you know, she, she did the best that she could at being a parent. But when you have, she has stage five colon cancer. And when you're sick like that, there's only so much that you can do. At that time in my life, not only did I was going through all that, but I had to be a parent to my parent. Mm -hmm. You know, I had to cook food for her. She would knock on the wall. And, you know, I knew that's when you got to go get mom food. Mm. I can't go out and play. I got to chill with mom. And I got to cook for mom. Mm. At the same time, going off. No food in the fridge. And so, you know, you live in a city. You young. I mean, you don't live in a city, but you live in an area that sometimes people do certain things and you start to get ideas about doing certain stuff. Mm. But then at the same time, when all this stuff is going on, I had this. I We didn't go to church that much, but I always had this moral conviction about God. Mm. Like even when I walk past a church and I'll be with my, my bad behind little friends and we'd be cursing, talk about girls. Once we would walk past a church, I'm like, hey, okay, stop, stop cursing. Don't step on the grass. Don't step on the grass. That was my idea of God. Like mm. you just respect just physical building. You get what I'm saying? And so 
I always had this moral conviction about God. And I don't know where I came from. And I really think that was because God knows who he has chosen in life. Mm. And, you know, it's a moral conviction that I had. So, uh, yeah, I hope. No, no, this, this is perfect, man, because, you, you know, you, you, you painted the picture really, really vividly, right? Because I, I think I'm seeing all of these moving parts. And, I'm, I, you know, I think even as someone hearing it empathetically, you get overwhelmed. Like, whoa, you know, mm. at any stage, I don't care if you 40, 60, you know, it, if you are navigating, just, just navigating your parent being in such a vulnerable space, right? And then yeah. seeing them, you know, like fight, right? Physically and seeing decay, see all that <laughs> happening. While at the same time, you're dealing with just the realities of just socioeconomically just being distressed. Like, yo, we don't have money. We're poor. Just just straight up poor. Yeah. You're dealing with that. You're just dealing with like, yo, I'm, my dad's not here. So I'm, I'm struggling with that and just the dynamics of, of all of that. You got mad siblings. So even if you were, so so for me, even just have mad siblings, I have mad siblings, but it's just like it's still relative, right? So it's like, yo, okay, four kids, yeah. four additional people. So you're like, all right, so y'all fight. You're, and then you're growing up. You're trying to figure out who you are. That's one of the biggest things, who you are, who I am, who am I in the world? What's my value? Am I important? What makes me special? And then you're getting all of this feedback from the world, from kids, from the education, from all this stuff that maybe I'm not special or maybe there's something wrong or maybe something's going on. So I just want to, I, I almost wanted to just kind of like put some pillars on the ground and be like, fam, that's a lot for a child to deal with. And you talk a lot about just the depression, right? The, the depression that in things that you wrestle with. So for you, what did that, you know, was it just that I manifested when it came to my anger, but was there also like just loneliness detachment where you're kind of like, you know, how did you manage? What were those moments like of just depression that, you know, that you had to manage day to day, man? Yeah, that's a good question, bro. And um, I, I didn't even know back then when I was going through it, like, you just now saying it's like, bro, I was probably, I probably was depressed. You know what I mean? And at that point in time, like depression is something that we always talk about nowadays. Mm -hmm. Like, but back then, yeah, like, you don't, Nobody talks to to you about depression, mm -hmm. and that's probably why I was so angry mm -hmm. about life was because I'm depressed. And on top of that, it was so hard for me to build relationships because you know when you're living on Section Eight, like I don't know why we just moved around so much. So I would make friends, lose, friends, make friends, lose friends, make friends, lose friends, and so it was like, bro, like you really don't have anybody to talk to. Mm -hmm. And so I made certain friends. And, you know, but my friends, they were going through stuff, too. So it was that, that type of uh, commonality that we could just grip onto each other. So um, that depression, um, it really set in hard, bro. And it just and, and so when you're in class and I think about, you know, when I hear about kids that act up in school, like I understand why they're probably going through that, because when you're going through depression, you don't care about anything like you just depressed. And so you just act out in so many different ways. And that's probably the reason why I acted out early on in my education. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, that's that. And, and he even said with vitiligo that depression or stress could be something that causes for vitiligo to happen. So mm -hmm. there can be many different uh, implications of like from that depression. This is, um, you know, I, I, I think people make light of, uh, you know, even just the impact of hunger or not having enough food. And the big, you know, the thing that we make fun as we get older is just kind of like, oh, hangry and things like that. But I think clearly over the years, people have come to understand, like, a child that's hungry can't really learn, right? <laughs> and, you know, imagine the type of stress that you're under on top of the responsibility of having to grow up so young and take on that responsibility. You know, there was a moment that, you, you know, that you, you've mentioned before, you know, around, you know, it just, it just what I would call a best way to call an encounter that you had, you know, um, you know, around just like where God became really real to you, where you were like, we, well, you. <laughs> you know, I need to be sure, you know, you know, you know, whatever you feel comfortable sharing. I, I think that, you know, the, this, this past week I was talking about just like, have you ever, you know, you know, had, get, get a God to answer prayer from God and it scared you, you know what I'm saying? Like when you told me that story, I had to sit like, woo. So could you tell a little bit about like, you have this context, this turmoil, you have all this weight on your back and you're down, you're depressed, you're kind of fighting back, doing what you need to do. And then talk to, to this instance that you had, this encounter you had. All right. So I'm going to backtrack a little bit. There's a lot that leads up to it. Mm. And so 
I'm from a small town called Woodbury, New Jersey. And about when I was two years old, um, we were living in the house. Uh, we were on Section 8. And because we were on Section 8, there were so so many strict guidelines. Like, you had to do this. You couldn't have this many people living in your home. You couldn't have, you know, pets. You couldn't have a trampoline in the backyard. You couldn't have this. You couldn't have that. And so it was like, my mom was like, yo, they can't even be kids. So she broke a lot of the rules. Um, we had extra people living with us. And it came to a time when uh, we had a lot of people living with us. And um, a fight had broken out in my house. And I'm not going to get into all the details. A fight had broken up in our house. And um, the cops, they had been to our place a few times. And so they was like, if we come back to your place one more time, we're going to call your landlord and let them know that you are you're, you're you have all these extra people living here. And so when this fight broke out, you know, uh, the cops got called. They called the landlord. And now we're facing eviction. We got to leave. We got to find a place to live. And so, you know, luckily we have family. Because I have 10 siblings, my mom has 12 siblings, you know, we always have family. Luckily, I had an aunt that I love dearly that took us in. And she moved us to a suburb. Where I came from was a small town. You can call it a suburb. Um, but she moved us into another suburb where I was extracted from the environment that I was in. Mm. And I was put into a totally different environment. And that moment there, something that was so bad that it seems like now looking back in hindsight, I saw that that was God. Mm. So he extracted me out of that environment, put me into a new environment where I was totally uncomfortable. And so eventually... You know, we lived with my aunt in temporary housing for a few months and we got into affordable housing um, down the street from where she lived at. And that way we had access to better school, better, better education. And um, we also had access to a church. It was a church like on every spot. And so my mom, she had cancer. And um, I'm going to speed through. My father had passed away um, when I was about 16 years old because of complication of issues. And so my mother, she she has cancer. My father just died. And the doctors are telling her that she is maybe facing death next. She feels that. And my mom, by herself, she had no car, no license, nothing. She walked about five miles to church by herself. She walked to this church that was uh, down the road. And um, she went to church that day. And she met this beautiful woman named Miss Jackie. And then this woman, this woman named Miss Jackie who had breast cancer. Um, so she sympathized with my mother having cancer. Uh, she was just like an angel sent. And she said, you know what? I'm going to pick you and your kids up every single Sunday to come to church. And so next Sunday came, my mother was sick because she was on chemotherapy. But yeah, my mother was sick. So me and my little brother went. And we went to the church. And when I went to that church, man, the amount of love that the people there poured out on me. Like, bro, I came there with a Nike hoodie, you know, like just sagging my pants, baggy pants, whatever. Timberlands, all that type of stuff the amount of love that they had poured on me was just amazing. Mm. Like from people that I didn't even know, it just like filled my heart with abundance. And so I continued to go to that church and the men there taught me everything. It was my first time that I saw a platonic family, like mother, father, kids, married, not just living together, mm. you know, not no common marriage, which is nothing wrong with that, but they were actually a platonic family. And so that was my first time seeing that. And I'm like, wow, just opened my, my mind up to a whole nother world um, that I had not been so privy to in the past. And so I started going to church a little bit. Um, oh, man, I think I missed the part. I'm sorry. Oh, no, you, so, not, you, you, you said like you're going to church and your mom, your mom had you know made that move. You guys got connected. You're feeling the love from everybody, men, yeah, yeah. people loving on you. And she's taking you to church. Right, right, right. So I want to backtrack a little bit. I'm sorry. I'm kind of no, no, you good, you good. Don't worry, man. Please. Yeah. So, uh, so what happened was I moved to this new town, um, the suburban town with my aunt, and we started going to a new school system. We went to affordable housing, and uh, one day after school, I had a pretty hard day after school, and I came home, and uh, my mother was on the couch, and she was just like, you know, on chemotherapy, and she had a bucket next to her, just like a bucket of blood. Mm -hmm because she was on chemo, so she was just vomiting all the time. And the lights was off, opened up the fridge, there's no food. My father had recently passed away, and at this time I had to be about 16 years old. And I'm already having a rough time making new friends at school. You know, it's like a lot of drama going on. And I'm just like, yo, I'm, I'm stressed out. And I remember before my dad had died, six months prior to that, 
he says, you know, CJ, I'm, I'm leaving you to be the man of the family. And so that was an enormous burden that was not put on me. Mm. Like now I have to be the family. And so I came home that day and I just saw the conditions that we were in. And I had a cousin who was involved in, you know, selling drugs. I don't know. Like, I think he was just like weed and other stuff as well. And so I'm like, you know what? He had asked me if I wanted to get involved with what he was doing because he heard about what my family was going through. I'm like, you know what? I know my parents told me to never get into that type of activity. And my dad made me promise to him before he died that I would never do some stuff like that. But you know what? I think he might have to. So I picked up my phone. I went out of my room and I got my phone. And my hands is like shaking. And I'm like, and I got really angry. And I was just like, I was like, no, I'm not going to do it. Instead, I'm just going to kill myself. Mm-hmm. And so I took it up from around my waist and I tied it around my neck and I began to look for something to like hang myself from. So I went in my closet and I saw something that I could potentially do it from and I got like a, a stool and I went to go step up on the stool. And when I went to go step up on the stool, something came like a rushing wind and just hit me in my chest and put me on my butt. And I just began to cry and I began to weep and I cried and cried and cried. And I don't know how, but when I looked to my left, the sun was just like, like was streaming in through the window. And I don't know how, but my Bible was just sitting in the door jam um, right on the floor at that very moment. And that was my God moment. I'm like, yo, this has got to be God. And I crawled over to my Bible and I grabbed it and I said, God, I'm not I'm not I'm not going to do this. I'm going to give my life to you. And um, I prayed to God. I'm like, God, listen, I was like, I want to give my life to you. I'm not going to do this. But there's God, there's some things that I need. And I told him, like, God, I need a car. I need a job. And I want my mom to be free from cancer. And I'm not trying to say that God always, you know, he, he will give you what you ask for in his will. As long as, like, material things. But because of my faith and because I was in a time of true need, um, I wasn't asking out of luxury. Um, God fulfilled every single one of those things that I needed. Mm. Within a week, I went to church. I told you about that. Um, I got a car, I got a job, and my mother got a call from her doctor saying that she was now in remission. This is within a month span, all this stuff happened, and God had fulfilled every single one, every single request that I had, God had fulfilled it. And that just was like, yo, God, like one, my Bible was there at that very moment. Two, I cried to him. He heard me, and he delivered on every single one of his promises. And I didn't. I wasn't no Bible thumper. I didn't know a whole bunch of scriptures. I didn't go in that prayer like quoting scriptures. I said, "God, this is what I need," and God heard my prayer. And that from there, I went to church. And um, am I gonna say I hit the ground running? But no, that change began to progressively happen. And I think that that day that that happened was the day that I gave my life to Christ. At that mm. moment. Yeah, bam. This is a. Uh... You, it, it, you, when people say, but God, you know, I, I think it's, it's but, become the same, but like, but God, but that, that is, you know, I, I, now I would like, hold, I like holding on to this moments because one, I'm thankful for you sharing, you know, it, it's something that's so personal, but it's also, I think there's sometimes extremes when, you know, we talk and people share their stories. It's, there's this extreme of people hearing it and they, and they, and they feel overwhelmed or they feel alienated because they're like, man, I ain't have a moment like that. Right. Or. Yeah. You know, what we would hope is that people see that and the empathy that like the connection, the human connection is just like, wow, like that's just another yeah. data point of things I've been seeing and hearing about, um, about God, about how real he is. Right. Why would all how many people would be sharing moments like this? And so I'm hoping that people take the latter. Right. That they, they see that and they say, yo, this is real. And I, and, I, and I talked about, you know, you up front. I didn't throw out, I don't throw around words lightly, man. And I say you're a one of one because, you know, as this now, you know, you have this moment. And then like all of us, you start your journey, right? You're like, all right, <laughs> I got my back. I'm just, I'm, I'm a day at a time, moment at a time. I slip up, get better. And, but I think the thing that jumps out for me is just like the heart for service jumping out real. Because now you now get into like, 15, 16, it was like, you know, around that, about 16, 17, these, these, these moments, this is where like they, they, they discovery, the kind of the model discovery is going and, you know, happen and happening. So now you have a platform to share your story, right? You kind of have now this, that the MTV platform. And so could you talk about just 
you were being on your journey here and then now kind of being thrust into, I think, more visibility, right? The, it, from a faith perspective, like what was the conversation with God as this is all happening? You're like, oh, snap, what's going on? Like talk about a little bit about just when that happened, when the switch happened, and then, you know, how you were connecting with God at that time to just kind of guide you. Yeah, and I want to hit on one thing that you guys said previously too. Like a lot of people don't have like this, you know, it's like, uh, it's a song by the truth, and it's called My Story. And I love this song. He's like, I don't got no horror story. I was, but I forgot the lyrics to the song. But he's just saying how, you know, he doesn't have this big horror story of how he came to God. But it was just by, you know, the blood of the lamb covered him while he was a child. Mm. And that's okay. Like, some people have these crazy stories where they just came to God. That's some people's stories. But some people come through God, come to God just by reading a book or, you know, reading a C.S. Lewis book mm. or reading a Bible. They come through understanding. Some people come through emotion, and that's okay, because I eventually had to get to that point, too. Mm. And so, you know, I just love the fact that you said that, that you you don't need this extreme story to come to God. Mm. Like, God fully evident in Scripture. Mm. He's fully evident. Many people have received his word in many different ways. So mm. I thought that Good was... Word. Um, yeah, but being thrust into, uh, I guess you could say, into MTV in front of the camera... Uh, it was it it was it had it was a lot. Um, so when that happened was I was about I would say uh, 19 years old, and um, me I, I had like this transition in my life when I was a kid. I was like, man, I want to be on on TV. Then I got on Vidalago, and I'm like, nah, I don't like being in front of the camera. And then around this time in my life, I'm like, ah, you know, I'm in college. You know, I'm I'm a part of Christian Ministries in college, and I'm just chilling. Mm. And so the way that it happened was is that uh, I had took a selfie of myself. And this is like, at this point in the time, my uh, vitiligo is fully evident. It's all over my face, almost what it is today. So I took a selfie. Um, boom, I took it. And then I went off to school. I just threw my, my phone in my pocket and I went off to school. And somebody had actually asked me to come to school in my Christian ministry and share my testimony. Mm. And usually when I had shared my testimony, I never brought up my skin. Mm. Um, I would talk about other stuff. But this time I was like, you know what? I'm going to deliberately talk about my skin. I'm, I'm, I'm going to make sure that I at the end about my vitiligo and I did that I talked about it and then um, I went to school that day did my testimony when I came back home my phone was just buzzing 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 and I looked at my Instagram my Instagram I'm like yo somebody happened to my Instagram but what actually happened was that this uh, famous uh, albino model, model had uh, reposted me on his Instagram and he tagged in my skin I win and it was Sean Rose um, and he had reposted me and from that moment, photographers started to hit me up and, um, you know, wanted to do uh, photography with me. Mm -hmm. So eventually I went out to Brooklyn. I did a shoot. I did two shoots in one day. And um, I remember there's one photo that I had taken. And I'm like, man, I hope he never posts this photo. Because <laughs> I'm like, Yo, it's the one photo that I didn't want for him to take to, to post. And he posted it and it went crazy. So I'm in Brooklyn, right? It's cold as heck outside. And one, like, you don't know from Instagram who these people are. Yep. So when I met this guy, no no, no disrespect, but he looked nothing like what he looked like on Instagram. <laughs> like, you feel me? He I'm like, I'm like, hold up. This, this, ain't, this ain't adding up, bro. I'm like, hold up. <laughs> he had a French accent. And I'm like, bro, what I get myself into? <laughs> like, I'm like, thank God I want somebody with me because I don't know. And then he had asked me, like, when we were texting, he was like, he was like, where do you want to do the shoot at? I asked him, I was like, where do you want to do the shoot at? He was like, mm, possibly in my in my bedroom. I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm like, I'm, I say, I'm a Christian, but I had to say, hell no. Yep. I was like, hell no. I don't do that. I'm sorry. Excuse my language. But anyway, so I went, I did this shoot with him, and he had me put this white t-shirt on in a dead winter in Brooklyn, where everybody's saying, that you got crackheads saying, oh, who's, who's this? And who's this guy? Let me get a picture. I'm like, oh, man. Like, let's let's get this rolling. Yep. So he was like, you sit down, sit down on the curb. So I'm like, all right, cool. I sit down on the curb. And then he came and he slung his, his camera to his back. And then he was like, your head on the fire hydrant. I'm like, why are you with my head on a fire hydrant? So he was like, put, he, so he leaned me over. He was like, your head on a fire hydrant. He's like, oh, beautiful. And I'm like, I love your skin. And I'm like, okay. He's like, now look angry, angry. I'm like, okay. All right, so I give him an angry face. I'm like, that's easy because I'm pretty, I'm pretty upset at this time. It's cold out. So he took the picture, 
I'm like, and I looked at my boys, I'm like, yo, is this look cool? And they're like, yeah, look, all right. So I took the picture, and I'm like, all right, he's not going to post it. Man, once I got on the train to go back home, he had posted the pictures already. He had posted this picture. I'm like, man, he posted that picture. Lo and behold, they went and made this big meme out of this picture. And I was loving it, man. I thought it was funny. I forgot what people had said. They was like, when your credit, when your credit score started to go up, you went from like <laughs> black to white. Bro, I thought it was hilarious. Mm. When somebody hit me with the meme, uh, they was like, yo, what you think? And I was like, yo, I think this is hilarious. And they were like, why do you think it's hilarious? They were like, you know, talking about your skin. I'm like, if it's funny, it's funny. Mm. And so meme just like made me even more popular mm. on social media. And from that point, eventually, eventually throughout the years, like two years later, MTV ended up catching a hold of me as I started booking more modeling gigs, as my uh, photos started to get on Instagram and Twitter. And um, MTV hit me up. And they want to do a documentary about my skin and how vitiligo has affected me. And so to answer your question and how like just being thrown into the limelight was, um, I thought it was pretty cool at first. It, it didn't really set in until afterwards when, um, you know, I was in school and ministry and, you know, you got people hitting you up. You got women contacting you. Like, you know, how you balance all this type of stuff. Now people want me to come out to New York on the weekends and shoot, it was a lot, so I was pretty stressed out. Mm. And yeah, it was, it was it was stressful. It was stressful. Well, but but just the ability to to, to handle it. I I had a conversation with a with, with a brother. Shout out to uh, Matt Perry, and uh, he was just talking about how like just he didn't see it at the time. He he went through some really tough valleys of just disappointment, and you know just real track star, and then you find himself kind of like working at um you know like he was working at a box office somewhere you know because he was just like i got i, I had to you know take take some time away from school because you know dre's dropped all this stuff and he was just working 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 but like in that time of him working at the box office it was like the work ethic that god was forming in him right it was like felt like punishment but then the, the flip side of it is just it's not like this was like training, like God caused these things to happen, right? But you you had to take on a lot of responsibility very early. You had to have some level of discipline to be able to respond when you're hearing a knock, to be able to get out and do it, to be able to show up on Sunday. These are things we don't think about. And then now you find yourself in a position where you just take it for granted. Okay, I just showed up in Brooklyn. I just showed up. It's just like, no, but there was something in you that allowed you to be able to do and meet the obligations in such a faithful right. way that I just think that I don't want people to miss of God's formation in, in all of that stuff that was happening. And so, so I, this, even with this and coming across this story and reading the story and reading the CNN article and then reading this other article, I'm like, Oh, he ain't bored in town. That's what they said. You know, like I, I was catching all these joints along the way, but the yeah. thing that even blows me away with this is just, I think just where you now, where, where you put your energy and your work, and so when I, when I found out the work that you're doing today and knowing your story of, of, of having to navigate, you know, the maze and the, and the systematic nonsense of some elements of public housing and just that dynamic and you doing that work, I was just, it just blew me away, man. And so how did you think about <coughs> that? Right. So, you know, some people could think, okay, I need to double down my model career and that's it. Right. That's the thing that I need to do. And that, and it will be fine if you feel informed because there, there are great models of faith who that's all they do. Right. How did you think right. about it? Was it like, all right, I'm going to do this on the side, but I feel God has called me to to do this work. Right. You also serve National Guard. You, you like you do. So like what was the process of making decisions for the work that you did? Was it just necessity? Like I'm just trying to survive or was it necessity? And I feel a call to do this work. Yeah. So well, modeling, um, it was a fun hobby. Mm. And, I, and I love the fact like now looking back. I realize how my, I see everyone, a lot of young men and older men being able to feel free to, sh to have the LIGO and show it and be in the modeling industry. And I sat back recently, like this year, and I was like, wow, I can't believe that I actually contributed to it. Like, mm. that's what my, my photo shoots went towards. Like, I love the MTV thing because the main thing that I wanted to get to people was that my confidence comes from God, mm. right? And that to do through my modeling, hopefully, and I'm glad that I was able to come onto this podcast and share that that was the reason why I did it. That's the reason why I went on CNN. And that's the reason why I went on MTV. And but some people just took that 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 confidence. It was like, you know what? I could have confidence in my skin too. Mm. And so 
saw that and I and I appreciated that. At first, I, I did it as much because I'm like, okay, I'm just taking photos. Like, what is this doing for the kingdom of God? Mm. But during like, MTV shoot, there was like somebody committed. I heard a story. It was like somebody committed suicide because of the bit of I go. And I'm like, wow, this is the reason why I'm doing it. So that forms some type of passion. Um, but like I said, it was it was a more so a hobby for me. And where my passion exists and where I lie at, I would say would be to uh, giving back to neighborhoods in a way that because the affordable housing and me, you know, being on Section 8 and finding affordable housing, that has such a great impact on me in my life. I struggled with what I wanted to do in my life and God had traveled me down this direction to what I'm doing now. And I think that he got me to this direction for a reason and for a purpose, because this is where my heart truly is to do this full time and to do modeling. Cause I will, if I could do modeling full time, I would, but eventually I will get back to the place of giving people, giving the homeless, um, giving low income families, moderate income, middle income families, um, a place to live. You know, because that's what was given to me. Mm -hmm. And so I found passion is doing what I'm doing today, which is building affordable housing for uh, low to moderate income families mm -hmm. and, um, you know, being a real estate developer. Mm -hmm. um, that's where my true passion sort of kind of, if it's going to be in a profession, that's where I felt called to. I always felt called to public service because public service had done so much to me, ministers. Mm -hmm. um, and, a, you know, it's a blessing in America. We have systems of section eight um you know of uh, uh, food stamps many other countries they don't have that type of stuff mm. so that stuff is a blessing mm. and i want to be able to get that um but i also had to sit back and realize the effect that modeling had too not only is it providing an income which it is i get paid for a lot of modeling gigs um but me i'm a purpose-driven per person like what is the per like, i don't want to just take pictures because i want to show off these clothes and like i will like if the, if the money's right the money's out. <laughs> yeah i mean if the cloth right i'm a rock <laughs> well so i'm not gonna say hey you want to model these clothes you want to do this skin? that's fine too but at the core of it what is the purpose of it you get what i'm saying and the purpose is to help people that have something they feel as though their body is too big or the body is too small there's something wrong with their skin like yo it is okay. Mm. Not not everything is as the media portrays it to be. Like real people need to be on so, social media. Real people need to be be promoted inside of uh, modeling. Mm. And so uh, I think that that was a blessing as well. But yeah, back to the affordable housing. Um, I think that that's where the uh, my true passion exists. And um, just a real estate development in total. Um, that is a, a definite passion of mine. And um, I think that that's the ministry in itself. Right. Yo, man, bro, this is your, you know, God knows the time. Like I'll, you always hear about just kind of like you are, you are born in this time in history for a reason. And I think mm -hmm. there is a unique, um, there's a unique tension that I think this generation, generations now that are existing now in this kind of social media environment and pressure that they're under around image and who am I and how do I look and this and that. And so to be able to have someone who is really carrying the light um and and pointing them into the direction of just finding their identity and something beyond others acceptance but also accepting what god has given them man you're you're, you're carrying the torch but then also a model because you would think that the, the 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 chase today is to be famous is to to be famous and to have money and please i don't think it is i, I don't think it's it, it is it is a bad thing to want to be um economically secure uh to be to have much to give much to be generous and to I don't think that is, it is anything against what God may have for, for, for some, right? But I do believe that just you as an example of, I could do these things, but I'm actually turning back uh, to do this work to serve. Man, I, I think that's tremendous. Bro, I, 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 you know, I, I think my, my question now is kind of what's ahead, man? I think even as we tail in this, this, this conversation, what do you, what, what are you, what are the things that you're working on or what are, how are ways that people could partner with just the, the work, the purpose-driven work that you're doing? Um, so in terms of, I'll start with, because I have two careers that I'm, I'm juggling. So I'll start with the modeling first. Right now I just signed with a uh, management company, finally, mm -hmm. and it's called Bridge, Mo uh, Bridge Models. Mm -hmm. And um, I could have done this a while ago, 
And uh, some people always tell me, you know, bro, you need to post on Instagram more. But sometimes I'm so dedicated to the other stuff that I do. But I'm to the point now where I understand that there is a purpose to it. You know what I mean? And that absolutely there's a big economic resource within it. So um, I just signed to a modeling agency and um, I'm looking to book more gigs and modeling with them. Um, a lot of people are reaching out to me, so I do have more content that should be coming out. Um, so, yeah, that's that on that end. Um, as far as the affordable housing, uh, well, real estate development and just community revitalization. Right now, uh, I'm at an entry level position and I'm just trying to move my way up in the, uh, in the ladder and uh, get to a place where eventually I could be the person um, that is fully in control of buying real estate being able to control like how much the rent is or if I'm able to sell a home to at a certain price for people because it's subsidized. So eventually I would love to get to the place where I am my own real estate developer and uh, be able to secure funding so that I can build developments for people to live in. And um, I have a true passion for uh, economically distressed areas um, because I think that in a way, you know, our, our communities have been redlined and now there's access to resources and we have to use those resources while they're still available in order to help these communities be revitalized. Mm. Um, what's that, mm. bro? Man, I, that's you know, one. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just want to put some fire under that, man, because I, I think that there'll be those who will listen in here and just, uh, you know, want to come alongside you, man, and uh, you know, offer any offer an opportunity to help accelerate uh, what God's already doing in that area of your life, and then also congrats. On the model and like we, we we like we ain't surprised man we just know like we know more ahead in that area brother yeah. brother man uh, this has been a, this has been a joy man obviously this is not the only conversation you and i will have but um I'm, I'm thankful that you and i could just even just you know publicly um lock arms around just your testimony um the work and how you how your faith informs how you think about your work i think the purpose piece bro this is, is worth his weight in gold because uh, i think a lot of people I feel lost and they're still searching for what they should do and why they should be doing it. So I know that's going to be powerful, man. Bro, how do people find you, man? How do people connect? How do people find you online, man? Yeah, man. So y'all can follow me on Instagram at double underscore Curtis Mac. That's double underscore, two underscores. Curtis Mac. You could also uh, follow me on Facebook at Curtis J. McDaniel. It is the picture profile um, that has, I'm in a gray sweater and I'm sitting on a chair. So that's how you can follow me. Yo, King, man, this is all respect, man. I'm excited, man, and obviously looking forward to that workout. Uh, but I'm but about many other things, man. So all respect to you. Thank you again, and God bless you, man. Godspeed, bro. Amen. Thank you, bro. Appreciate oh, you having me. All right.